as you walk through this kind of a life. You fall in love with places, you make real connections with people, and then you have to say goodbye. And um, somewhere in this feelings of sadness and feelings of joy, a deeper journey unfolds. Welcome to the Side Hustle Lounge. If you're looking for flexible ways to earn income, grow your mindset, and live the lifestyle you've always dreamed of, you're in the right place. So lower the lights, grab your favorite beverage, and join your host, founder of NotaryCoach.com and Amazon best-selling author of Sign and Thrive, How to Make Six Figures as a Mobile Notary and Loan Signing Agent, Bill Soroka. Cheers, and welcome to my next guest, Bhavna Gasota. She's a technology professional, a self-taught artist and writer, and how I discovered her is she's the author of The Art of Slow Travel, See the World and Savor the Journey on a Budget. Bhavna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Bill, for inviting me on this uh, podcast, and um Before we continue on, I just want to say that I listened to some of the prior podcasts that you have, and I absolutely love the way the introduction comes on. You know, I feel like, especially with the ching ching of the glasses, (laughs) I feel like I'm sitting in a jazz lounge and Nora Jones is about to pick up her guitar and start crooning. Come away with me. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. it. Well, I'm glad it. creates that image for you. That's exactly kind of the vibe I was going for. Nora Jones should be here anytime. For you. Uh, yes, I think so. <laughs> I'm just filling in the I time gap until she shows up. <laughs> exactly. You're the, uh, you're, uh, I can't even remember it. You're kicking off a concert, the Nora Jones concert. Uh, well, that's awesome. I love it. Um, for those who are listening and don't know what you mean by slow travel, can you tell us what is slow travel and why did you write a book about it? Yeah, people uh, often ask me, uh, what is slow travel? And actually, to be honest, it's not something very new. It's something that I think we as uh, uh, humans or uh, as nomads and travelers have been doing for a very long time. Uh, It's just that like now we have a name for this idea where we um, travel slow. And like the name suggests, it means traveling slow. So it's kind of like the opposite of um, the fast-paced life and the fast-paced vacations that we tend to take, you know. So um, uh, uh, the opposite of flying for a week and having uh, 10 different places to travel to and visit in that one week. And you have this whole itinerary filled 8 a.m. breakfast, 10 a.m. go here, 12 p.m. there, 2 p.m. there, 5 p.m. a break, 7 p.m. dinner, and so on and so forth. You know, it's like it's it's those fast-paced itineraries where you are just constantly going from one to another to another. And slow travel is the exact opposite of that. It says slow down and take in where you are and drop the list of to-do things and just soak in the atmosphere and get to feel the essence of the place rather than going from one to another, to the third, to the fourth, and so on. So that's the simplest way of um, explaining what solo travel is. But if I have to define it in a more concise way, like I have done in the book, um, I find uh, slow travel to be an offbeat, slow and a responsible way of traveling in which everyday life unfolds within the framework of a different culture. So, you know, everyday life, like uh, whatever you might be doing in your uh, everyday life, you you could be working and living somewhere or waking up, going for a walk and uh, sitting down somewhere, enjoying breakfast while watching the scene ahead of you without having this thing of, oh, I got to here, go here, I got to go there and so on and so forth. You know, I really love the way that you describe that as feeling the essence of a place. I've traveled both ways. Um, I think I traveled like the one week vacation 
um, mode of traveling, like on cruises, on places where you, you, you like you fly into um, Toronto and then I've spend every day somewhere else besides Toronto. Mm. So Toronto is just this hub. And then people ask, what did you think about Toronto? And I have no idea how I felt about Toronto because I was never there. I didn't stop and experience it. I went all the other places for that. And I've also traveled the slow travel method, not quite to the extent you have, but I, I can totally see what you mean. And there's something special about sitting at a sidewalk cafe and getting to know the people next to you or seeing things that you uh, don't always slow down to appreciate in a in a crammed in vacation. What I love about your story too is you're literally living it right now as well. You're in another country as we speak, correct? That's right. I'm in my home country, India. I've been here eight months. Um that's right. I've been here eight months now. <laughs> and prior to uh, prior to this, I was in Mexico for a year and a half. And uh, I think uh, I think the COVID lockdowns um, slowed down my travels even more because I was I never thought that I would live in Mexico for a year and a half. Um, but COVID did that, and uh, in a way, I think it was a blessing in disguise because it slowed me down even more. Uh, and uh, that's where I ended up writing this book is in Mexico. And I started writing this wow. book exactly when the COVID lockdowns uh, started and I finished it. So to say, you know, at least I finished the editing part of it when the COVID lockdowns lifted. So, uh, yeah. That's incredible. What a great use of time uh, while you're in lockdown, you write a book and this was your first book, right? This was my first real book that I wrote. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I love is uh, for all of the guests I bring on the show, I send out a, a, a form with a series of questions on it. One of which is, what's your address? Because I love sending a thank you card and a gift to all my guests. But the response I got from you just nailed it for me. I absolutely loved it. And you just said that you're on your nomadic track. So you don't really have an address and you'll get back to me when you do. Uh, I think... For me, that tapped into something really special and I crave that life. But for others, it might feel um, a little nerve wracking for them. What advice uh, do you have for people who are wondering if this type of slow dra travel or nomadic life is for them? Uh, well, first of all, actually, I do have an address. Uh, I do have an address in the United States, but I don't usually give it out because I reserve that address for uh, important things like, you know, driver's license renewals and new credit cards that come not for personal um, things. And for personal things, I usually give out the address of where I am, where I currently am. Uh, now, now, in your case, uh I wouldn't want to keep giving you an updated address every year or so that I move. So I said, I don't really have an address that you can send something to. Um, it can be nerve wracking. Yes. I think the uh, uncertainty of things is what uh, can get to people. Um, but uh, for people who feel this uh, to be a bit daunting, let me just say that it's not really that daunting because uh, well, I mean, it does bring in a certain level of um, uh, discomfort, especially for people who have always sort of lived in one place and they always had a secure home or at least for most uh, part of their lives. And they have, a, you know, a fixed address where their life and the community sort of is built around that. And then suddenly that gets uh, dismantled and they don't have that. So it can be quite disconcerting for for uh, for people, um, and that's I uh, I think that's just one of the challenges, so to say, that um, that we as slow travelers face and overcome it over time. And uh, to be honest, now I don't really feel that uh, not having a fixed address in the United States, well, other than to you know an address to receive mail doesn't really bother me as much as it used to a long time ago. Um, so it's, just, it's, it's, it's a challenge and uh, it's something that we overcome over time. And then you hardly even think about it. You actually don't think about it until 
somebody asks you for an address and then you think, ah, oh, okay, what address should I give this person and for what reason, you know? Okay, so here's the thing. I have a very dear close friend of mine um, who lives in the Netherlands and he has made a commitment to me to uh, send me something. He's, he's made a commitment to send me chocolates every single year uh, on my birthday. And every single year, a month before my birthday, he sends me an email saying, what's your address? Where should I ship your chocolates to? And every single year, I give him a different address. And just this last, um, well, just my last birthday, I told him, Mark, uh, you must keep track of all the addresses I have sent you because at some point in time, I'm going to try and get that list from you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. That'd be an awesome list. Yeah. Great memory. Yeah, absolutely. Walk down memory it lane. would be a great yeah. memory, you know, let's say 10 years down the line to go through. All oh, right. These are all the addresses that I uh, I was at, you know? Yeah. Yeah, if you ever have to pass a security check, you might need your last 10 years of addresses, and this guy's going to be able to help you out. Absolutely. I think, Mark, you're responsible for keeping track of all my addresses. <laughs> oh, I love that. So, and that brings me to, I th- you know, what I used to talk about vagabonding all the time and uh, kind of similar to this, this type of lifestyle, uh, people would always ask, how are you going to pay for it? Or they would ask, what about your relationships? And you kind of touched on that a little bit is that if you do embark on slow travel, you might disrupt some of your regular relationships in your community. So how did you uh, overcome or what advice do you have for people who are struggling with, number one, the financial means to live a lifestyle like this, and two, their sense of community and relationships? Yeah, so uh, let's talk about the first, the financial means, because uh, I, what I find is that a lot of times people want to go on these type of long trips away from their home, but what really stops them is this question about how am I going to finance it? Um, and let's say they have ways to finance it. Then the next question that comes up is, when I return, will I be able to get back into my uh, career or my working life that I put a pause on while I was away? And this concern is more with people who are, uh, you know, there's the other, other set of travelers who are retired people or who have enough investments. So they don't really need to worry about uh, where their finances are going to come from. But this is mostly for people who are in regular main regular mainstream careers want to take a step back, go away, explore another dimension of themselves and this world. And then this worry um, does come up. So uh, let me just say uh, from my own life, what I've done, like um, my working life. So I used to work in technology and uh, there was a time when I was really just working in my gray cubicle office in the Silicon Valley of California, chugging away, you know, like clockwork, eight o'clock in the morning, reporting into the office and then working the whole day and then leaving. Um, and at that point in time, at, at some point in time, I decided to walk away from that kind of a life. So um in the beginning days, you know, I had enough um, savings to be able to that that funded my travels, um, and uh, subsequently, it was also during that time actually that you know I always used to dream about oh I wish um, I could take my laptop, go to a beach, and work from there. That would be a dream come true, and my dream was to be in Hawaii on a beach and work from there. But though that was the time when remote working was not possible. So here I was working in a big company, uh, Intel Corporation. And with the way the technology world is set up with VPN connections and so on, I could easily work from home or remotely. But that was just such a novel concept that it was not even something that was ent- that was being entertained back in the days, you know, uh, even working from home one day in a week was no way. You got to come into office, clock in at 8 a.m. in the morning, and that's the way things work. But now things have changed with technology and especially with the COVID times. Um, uh, it's much easier to make your uh, travel dreams come true without having to give up your mainstream job or your career. Now, of course, having said that, not all kinds of jobs can be done remotely. You know, for example, if you're a nurse, 
you you can't be living in Mexico and work as a nurse in the United States. You, you, you just can't do that. If you're a bank teller, you can't do that. But there are several professions where I see absolutely no reason why people really can't give wings to their travel rings and take their jobs with them wherever they go. So that's that's one aspect of it. That's for a certain kinds of certain, certain people who are in certain kinds of professions that they can really make it happen. Uh, the first time I went off on a long trip, I had to really um, basically take a sabbatical, an unpaid sabbatical from my work and and take off for uh, a while. Um, and then I was able to come back into my career. So again, there's this myth that if you t- go away for a long period of time, like six months or a year or two years, you won't be able to get back into into your career. And I found that and I proved, myself, proved that to myself that that's not true. You can come back. And in fact, actually, uh, when you do go on this type of a travel, it, it is such an enriching experience. Um that it adds several different life skills to your sort of portfolio, you know. Um, and if an employer uh, ha, uh, does not appreciate that, you probably don't want to work for that employer. So, <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, yeah you, you want to look for an employer who appreciates what you have uh, gathered in your life, not just through your prior work experience, but also through your uh, life experience, you know. Um, so coming back to work, uh, even if you had to give up your prior job, I think it's doable. I have done it. I've seen many pe- other people do it. So that's not, I, I think that I've broken that myth for myself at least. And so that's what I would uh, suggest to the audience, the people who are listening to this or who read my book, is that don't let that hold you down. The second part, like I said, is that especially with the COVID times now, um, more and more employers are absolutely open to the idea of letting people work remotely. Like companies like Facebook, Google, and LinkedIn, they've already told their employees, you don't need to come back to office as long as you don't want to. But again, these are tech companies. There are many other professions, you know, like editors and writers and yoga teachers and so on, who can take their skills on the road and create an income stream while they're on the road. So my book also talks about different ways to do uh, to jump into the gig economy, which can uh, sustain them. Um, uh, sometimes, yes, yeah, some professions, like I said, cannot be taken on the road, and that requires a little bit more creative thinking if uh, one has to go uh, beyond just using up the savings. And uh, then there's the gig economy part. And that does require a little bit of work to set up. It may not earn you as much as your prior job did, but it might earn you enough to uh, not blow a big hole in your savings or not blow a hole in your savings at all. One of the things that I've found a lot of people on the road doing is teach English remotely to kids in China, Taiwan, or teach business English to folks in Germany, France, you know, uh, so there are, and, and it really requires uh, not much of a startup to uh, get into that. So there are several ways, and I've sort of elaborated those um, in my book, is how to um, sustain yourself financially. And the other. Well, let's talk about that a little bit too, because real quick, mm-hmm. because if we try to maintain our current lifestyle in the US when we're abroad, that's kind of how we equate things, right? Right. But when you're traveling the rest of the world and, and specifically slow travel, what are our expenses like? Is it the same as in the U.S. or is it different? Right. So I was about to get to that point. So could you ask this question? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So here's the thing. like, um, How much you spend on the road does not have to be a lot more than how much you spend at home for your everyday life. In fact, it can be much lesser. And the way it can be lesser is if you travel to countries where you have a currency advantage, So, for example, you work in the United States, so you have your earnings in U.S. dollars. Or let's say you are European and you have your your earnings in in euros. Um, And so your savings are in euros and so on. Um, If you want to get more bang for your bucks, so to say, then the way to do that is to travel to countries where you have a currency advantage. So, for example, if you um, travel to Peru, 
Uh, the currency in Peru is three solars. That's the local. That's the that's the Peruvian currency is approximately three three point five solars to one USD. So if you travel to Peru, your one thousand dollars in the US will take you a longer way in Peru than they would in the United States. Then of course there is a spectrum. It depends on how you want to travel and what is the kind of lifestyle that you want to have. Do you want to stay in five star hotels and plush? And yes, you will need a lot more money. But still, going to a place with a currency advantage will give you a lot more mileage than the same amount of money would do in your home country. But part of slow travel for me is. It's also about a shift in your lifestyle. It's a shift about shift in the way you think about living your life, and the journey for me has been more, uh, has taken me more and more towards simplicity and towards minimalism. If someone is going to go and um, is going to travel to another part of the world and uh, try to maintain the same level of lifestyle, uh, looking for five star accommodation, for example. Then your monthly budget is going to be higher, but when you embark on a journey like slow travel, it's also about rethinking how you want to live and where you want to live. And one of the things about slow travel is to be able to connect with the local community, to actually drop into the life of the place where you're going, um, and that can happen only if you stay closer to the locals, closer to the way the locals live, and that that. It invariably ends up that it ends up such that you actually are spending much less than you actually did when you, in in your own home country. Now let's look at the other situation. Like you're earning in um, your your earning in U.S. dollars, and you decide to travel to let's say uh, Norway. Norway is tremendously expensive. A cup of just very basic coffee will cost you six or seven dollars. So then you got to read. You got to really think. Hmm, uh, how much mileage am I going to get in a country like Norway with what I have, and why am I going to Norway? So it really depends. You know, um, you could still have a you know the a lesser amount of money, and if you still want, if if going to Norway is what you really want to do, then you have to get creative in thinking about. How you're going to manage things over there, and there's several ways to do that. Like, you can do work exchanges, or you know, you can uh, enroll yourself in uh, immersion programs where your the cost of your day-to-day living drops down. Um, so there are several ways to manage that. Does that kind yeah. of answer your question, or did I ramble off? <laughs> no, you, you did a really good job answering that in detail. And I'm so glad that you did because I know this is a, a major hindrance. But what I take away from what you're saying is that there's always a way. If you really want to visit a country, there's always a way to do it. Which brings me to the next part of the original question, too, is money is one component. But what about community and relationships? Uh, so we, I think this is a multifaceted question, too, because we've got the relationships we may have left behind that we try to maintain when we're on the road. And then there's this community that we meet along the way. So can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. This is a double faceted question, Bill, because you give up something and uh, then you get something while you're on the road. So uh, that would be a very big question for some people. Why should I give up the, everything that I have around me? Um, uh, this community of people, relationships around me, a very stable, secure kind of a life. And why should I get into, um, why should I bring in so much uncertainty in my life? Uh, well, that's where I think that um, the love for travel and the love for exploring uh, another place, another country, or another part of this really beautiful planet that we live on, uh, comes in. You really have to feel that uh, what I'm going to venture into, it's worth giving up what I have. Because otherwise, you know, why would you do it? Why would anybody do it? You know, you, that, that it's something, it's some, something inside you has to um, say, yes, I'm going to give up this, but I'm going to get something else in return. So every decision we make in life is like that, right, Bill, that um, we lose something yeah. and we gain something. So this is what you lose, um, and but then you gain a whole lot more while you're on the road. Um, you meet other people, uh, you 
plug into different communities, you form relationships along the road. And then again, as you move on or as they move on, because we are all sort of travelers on this path, you again go through this sense of uh, having to say goodbye. I think for me, over a period of time, what this has brought me is to uh, some sort of a place of uh, being detached, but not being detached in a very cold and uncouth manner, but uh, more or less kind of like this understanding that we are all, you know, part of some big grand journey. It's like a cosmic walk on this planet Earth. And literally every travel that I've been to and I've met, the, pe- the people I've met um, organically, at some point in time, I felt that we were just destined to meet in a way, for that short period of time. And then we all walk away in our, uh, on our own paths, you know. Um, and of course, then we have technology, which comes, uh, <laughs> it saves us. Okay, we have uh, Zoom calls and Facebook and um, we can keep in touch and make a promise that we'll meet again sometime on this big grand earth walk. And sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Um, what it has also uh, taken away and in turn given is I really value real connections with people where you uh, uh, have an enriching encounter rather than just chit-chatting along and having surface kind of scenario, uh, surface kind of uh, encounters. And those stay with me even if they're for a short period of time. They kind of, you know, um, stay with me for much, much longer. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, this definitely is a challenge, but it's also something that we learn from it as we go along. And uh, this is also where I guess, as we say, travel is a transformative experience and it brings about several levels of transformation. As you walk through this kind of a life, uh, you meet people you fall in love with places, you make real connections with people, and then you have to say goodbye. And um, somewhere in this uh, feelings of sadness and feelings of joy, a deeper journey uh, unfolds. Yeah. It, it sounds absolutely beautiful. And I, I'm, you're kind of leading me right to my next question. Earlier, you had said, traveling like this offers another perspective or another, you get to know another dimension of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, uh, through your journeys, adventures, and all of this emotion that you're describing, uh, what have you learned uh, both of yourself and of the world? The biggest takeaway I have from this is that we are all the same no matter where we are, no matter what culture uh, we are from, no matter what traditions we follow, no matter what our spiritual beliefs are, my biggest takeaway from this is that we are all the same. And uh, uh, several years ago, uh, if when, you know, I would hear somebody say that we are all one and we are all the same, I would think about it as, oh, it's a cliche. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, people say that there's all, uh, different spiritual philosophies which, which say that. And then you actually um, go through this kind of a life where you connect with people from different parts of the world. And what you uh, come to understand that we're all driven by the same things. We all have the same needs. We all have the same desires and we all have the same shadows. You know, we all long for the same things. We all long for community, for a sense of belonging, for, of, for being loved and to love and to share. Um, we all long for that. We all have the same shadows we have the same feelings of anger and this resentments and bitterness and abandonment and um, going through similar kind of traumas and how we handle with that. The tears that we cry and the laughter that we laugh is made up of the same stuff. And in the end, we are all the same. It really doesn't matter who we are or our, you know, color of our skin or. Uh, the spiritual beliefs that we follow, all of it doesn't matter if we drop down to our core feelings and emotions. If we drop the story and we go down to our feelings, emotions, desires, longings, we are all the same. 
We all want the same thing. We're all longing for the same thing. That's very beautiful. Do you find that that actually makes traveling easier with that realization? It absolutely does because, uh, well, let me put it this way. Um, the way it becomes easier is is the way you connect with another person that you might meet, you know, uh, another complete stranger that you might meet. You encounter that person not as uh, of a certain religion and a certain kind of a spiritual belief or following a certain tradition. Yeah, those are that part exists and, you know, th- those layers exist. But you also uh, learn to connect with that person as a human being, as another soul, you know. And sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not. And that doesn't mean to say that every encounter or every person I meet along the way, I can connect with them or it's easy to connect with them. No, it's not like that. It's also, it's a two-way dynamic. Um, But the first encounter is not with the layers that the culture or society imposes on us. The, the, the first layer of connection is, yeah, here's another human being. And that human mm. being is probably, not probably, is the same as me. And it depends on how much the other person and you together uh, in that specific dynamic are willing to become open with each other and vulnerable with each other. And that's where forms the beauty of that relationship. And that's what kind of stays in the heart as time goes by, even if we may never see each other again. Yeah. I, so I feel like you're just leading me right to every question that's popping into my head. So I love this. As you were speaking, uh, the word vulnerability came into my head. And I think there's, for a lot of people, there's this fear of being vulnerable when you go to another country. If if we get over the fear of going in the first place yeah, and we get there and we, we land at the airport and we're about to go somewhere how do you how do you make those connections uh in a in a country where maybe you don't speak the same language how do you be vulnerable in those environments um vulnerability i think not i think vulnerability comes with trust you have to trust um and that is a huge thing and it's it's not something that you can just do it's it's an ongoing journey it's and i think it's a journey that's never ending is uh this thing of being able to trust that you are in a new country maybe you don't know the language maybe you just know a few words of that language it's a culture that's foreign can you relate with people will i be able to trust people will i be able to open up with people here um, so it's a journey. It's not something that happens, oh, you know, here I am and now I can be completely vulnerable or open. No, it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen with everyone also. Um, so, yeah, it's a journey. It's a journey, Will. <laughs> <laughs> In more ways than one, it definitely uh, is. Yes, it is. It is. Bhavna, this has been a, a wonderful conversation. And again, I... I shared with you before we even started recording, I truly enjoyed your book and it inspired me to take even more action to create my own dream lifestyle of traveling the world, meeting interesting people and writing books and words that touch, move and inspire. And even after our conversation now, this was a beautifully deep um, review of what's possible when we get out in the world. Do you have any closing words of advice for people who are listening today? If you ever dreamt about it, um, then just do it. Don't think so much. Uh, Because I think a lot of times we wind ourselves up just thinking so much about, oh, what if this happens? What if that happens? We wind ourselves up in fear. And uh, one of the beautiful things about slow traveling is uh, I have learned to trust and I've learned to not um, let the fears take the better of me. So if you've ever dreamt about doing this, uh, start taking action and just go for it. Um, start planning for it and just go for it. Yeah. Well, excellent advice. And that sparked another question for me. And I can only speak from my experience. I'd love to hear yours, but I feel like the, uh, the call of the road or the mountains or, or whatever that is, uh, comes from deep inside. I've been a vagabond or a gypsy or whatever it is. The idea of just traveling and being on the road 
comes from within. Do you find that with yourself and with other travelers on the road as well? Are there people who feel this and don't feel this or is it the human thing? Um, I definitely feel feel it for sure. Uh, I had this love and I don't know why, like I cannot explain why, but I have had this uh, lure for travel since I was a kid. Um, and geography in school was my favorite subject. You know why? Me too. <laughs> um, because through geography, I was able to travel the world. You know, I would learn about the tundra and the prairies and the steppes and the Arctic. And uh, growing up in India in a small little town, I would always wonder, how is it like on the other side of people, or on the other side of the world? Uh, we didn't have TV back in those days and neither did we have internet. So um, there was a lot of curiosity that was getting generated from the geography textbooks. Um, and people have met on the road they have all been fueled by some sort of an inner call to, to uh, journey this earth. And uh, there are people that I've met who feel absolutely no calling for this. But those are not the people I've met on the road. Those are the people I've <laughs> okay. met around who feel, what's the big deal about traveling? Like, I don't understand it. I wouldn't want to pack my bags and go away anywhere and leave my safe, secure world over here. And that's fair too. So... It has to be an inner calling. It is an inner calling. And I think that uh, what slow travel is definitely an inner calling because you have to give up a lot in order to live this kind of a life. But even people who go away for short vacations, you know, because not everybody can take time off and there are other responsibilities in life that people have. So not everybody can take away six months or a year and go away. So even people who go for short trips, I would say even they have an inner earth. Somewhere deep down within them, they have a calling and people do as what is you know possible within their uh, limited circumstances and not... You, you work with what you've you got, with right? You work with what you got, yeah. So I, here's a piece of advice I'd love to get from you is if somebody um, only has two weeks vacation, how can they take that two weeks vacation and apply the principles of slow travel to that one week, maybe it's a three day weekend or whatever it is, the full two weeks, how can they apply this, the wisdom of slow travel to what they've got? Absolutely. This is also a question that uh, some of my friends ask me because not everybody can take time away for various reasons. So um, here's what I would say, go to, go to one place and stay there. For, your, for the entire duration, you know, pick a small place somewhere which is really close by to you um, instead of flying halfway around the world for a three day weekend or for one week, pick a place that really calls you, which is uh, somewhere very near you and just spend your time over there. Do what the locals do, get down to that and uh, slow down. And keep going to the same place over and over again. A lot of times what I find uh, people asking travelers is, so how many countries have you gone to? You know, if you've been traveling for a while, how many countries have you gone to? And I would say, well, yes, I started traveling, let's say, 20 years ago. And I, I probably should have, should say, maybe 60 countries or 70 countries. But that's not the point. <laughs> so it's not a it's not a number game. I like to go back to the same place again and again and again. If that place leaves, uh, if that place has a special place in my heart, I prefer to go back there again and again. So if you have only a few days, go to one place, go to a place that's close by, and go to that place again, and go to that place again, and soak in and savor what that place has to offer, and. I think it's also important how you choose the place where you go. Um, it really has, I, I, I think that the, the, that uh, your heart has to really speak out to you that this is a place I want to go. For some reason, there is some kind of a pull to go there and go there once, twice, thrice. So until there's something inside you which says, okay, I'm done with this place. Mm. I love that. So do you, do you give people permission to do this travel even in their own country? Absolutely. 
So, slow travel is not about going away half around, halfway around the world into a completely unfamiliar place. You could just go 50 miles from your own house and, uh, to, to, yeah, and, and just stay there for a, for a few days, for a week, for two weeks. Yeah. What about experiencing slow travel in your own city? And that is also uh, another level of slow travel is experiencing slow travel in your own city. Yeah, take a whole day off. And uh, uh, let's say you are used to driving around your own city. Instead of that, pick a neighborhood and go walking in that neighborhood or go bicycling in that neighborhood. Explore a path where you rarely go in your own city and explore it in a different way. Um, you know, when I come back to my hometown in India, my hometown is so familiar to me because I grew up here. But of course, over a period of time, over this 25 years that I've been away, my hometown itself has changed. And so when I come back here, this is actually one of the things that's a challenge for me, but it's also a desire, is to experience my hometown not from the eyes of how I used to know it, but with a fresh perspective, with a fresh set of eyes. So you can travel in your own city, in your own hometown, wherever you are, with a different pair of eyes, with a different perspective altogether. Yeah, I, I love that. I'm a bit, huge advocate of doing that because you can find adventure everywhere, right in our backyard. And many of us live in cities or states where people travel from all over the world just to experience it. You know, I happen to be in Arizona where the Grand Canyon is and people travel literally from all over the world just to see the Grand Canyon. But there are people who have been born and raised in Arizona who have never seen the Grand Canyon. <laughs> yeah. And that sort of happens about the place where you are living. You tend to not think about it as a place that's interesting enough to discover. It tends to become a place where you live, you work, you earn your living and you go about your life. But it's it. It's not a place that's interesting for you to discover. It's interesting for the rest of the world to come and discover, but not you. And that kind of tends to happen about the place that you live. So that's what I meant when I said bring in a different perspective. Like, for example, uh, join a tour group that usually only tourists would go to. Join a tour group and you might learn something very different about your own city. Good idea. Um, Somebody I met in Copenhagen, when I, when I was living in Copenhagen, he decided to become a tourist guide. And he decided to become a tourist guide in his whole, own hometown of Copenhagen. Because that brought him in contact with a lot of different travelers who were coming from around the world. And showing them around his own city meant that he had to go on a discovery journey of his own city from a very different perspective. And he just took that up as a profession. Um, so that could be an interesting way of discovering your own city is maybe uh, do weekend or once in a week walking tours of a certain part of your city. Love that. Love that. Great idea. Uh, and, uh, it reminds me, I've actually done kind of similar to that. I've been all kinds of little odd jobs and things, but I took uh, like ATV adventures. I used to be a guide on there or the reservations guy. I used to be a hot air balloon. Um, ground crew, you know, and you meet people from all over the world and you get to share your state or your city that way. Absolutely. And through that sharing, uh, somehow you also discover more about your own city, but you also discover yeah. more about your own self just through that contact. Absolutely. Bhavna, this has been such a beautiful conversation. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your evening in India to hang out with us and share your uh, journey and your book, um, The Art of Slow Travel. If you're interested in learning more about Vabhavna, tracking her travels with her newsletter, or even buying her book, you can do that at sidehustlelounge.com forward slash VIP. That gets you into the free VIP room at the Side Hustle Lounge with all the resources from our guests. Bhavna, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bill. I really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. You have a great evening and safe travels. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Side Hustle Lounge podcast. You know, if you follow me on Instagram and social media, you already know that my pets play a huge role in my life and I include them as part of the family. They are part of my why. Dexter and Violet bring so much joy and love into my life that I always want to make sure 
that they are well tended to and healthy. That's where my Toto pet insurance policy comes in. Toto was voted best pet insurance company in 2021 by Forbes advisor. And it's known as the pet insurance company with a heart and without the gotchas. There's no network of obscure vets that I'm forced to choose from. So I get to pick my pet's doctor. And then depending on the policy I select, I can be reimbursed up to 90% of the vet bill. And they make it easy to use. You visit any vet, you submit a claim, you get cash back. It's pet insurance finally done right. If you'd like to support the show, get coverage for your own fur babies and maybe even give yourself some peace of mind at the same time, get an instant quote today on Toto's easy to use website at sidehustlelounge.com forward slash Toto. That's T-O-T-O.